Hey, welcome to Barley and Hops. I'm George. You know, anytime we get an opportunity to talk about distilling, beer making, wine, or our community of distillers and brewers, our customers, anytime we get a chance to do that, my goodness, it's a good day and we get all excited about it. So please forgive me. Hey, if you've been here before, welcome back. If this is your first time, well, welcome to our brew laboratory or whatever you want to call it. We do the very best we can to share as much information as possible to help make you successful uh, in your own hobby. Um, Look, I got a couple of things I want to show you today, but before I do that, hey, a shout out to Joe Monte. He and I had a great, he's from New Jersey. He and I had a great conversation on the phone today. As with all the conversations I have with all the folks that give us a call, uh, we worked through some problems, some issues. I think we resolved the issue that we ran into, but it, a lot of times it just takes, you know, the talking back and forth to understand what each other are talking about. And then we figured out what the problem was. So, hey, good on you, Joe, and have a safe trip here in the next couple of weeks when you take off on those bikes. So, without further ado, look, I've got two things I want to talk about today. One of them is going to be sanitation, and the other one's measurement. Measurement always, we do that one first. Measurement always seems to be a challenge because a lot of times there's just a lack, not a lack of information, but, you know, if you hit the pause button or the fast forward and you don't catch that one or two sentences, it makes a big difference in the outcome. Look, if you call me and we have a discussion um, and your first question is, George, what happened? Uh, it's not bubbling. W what's happened? My first question to you was probably going to be, did you check the gravity to start with? It gives us a, a good start, a data point. It gives us a starting point. If your answer is no, we're going to have a hard time uh, because we have nothing to go by. Uh, so please, uh, get in the habit of checking the gravity you know, prior to fermentation. Uh, and then you can track fermentation through that as well. Uh, also, a proof and trail hydrometer will uh, allow you to test the volume of alcohol that you have in your spirit. Um, so that's also another good tool to have. So I'll always ask normally, you know, what was your original gravity? Or, hey, by the way, did you test the gravity? And every time I ask that, I'm always hoping you say yes. And my reading was. Uh, so that gives us a good point to start from. So just keep that in mind. Now we've got, and I've got, you see the board I've got written. Every time we've got the board, you know we're going to do a little bit of math. Just a little bit, but I've got a couple things to show you here. These are two. This is called a proof and trail hydrometer. And this is used only, only, only for spirits. Not used for a wash or a beer or a wine. It's absolutely useless to us, and I'm going to show you why. Now this is called a specific gravity hydrometer. And this is used for the wash, the beer, the wine, but you cannot use it for spirits. And again, I'm gonna show you why. But those are the two tools that really come in handy that we've gotta have if we're in the distilling world or if we're just in the beer world. If we're in the distilling world, it's nice to have both of them, almost a requirement. If you're in the beer wine world, you only need one, and that's the gravity hydrometer, specific gravity hydrometer. Now, some of these hydrometers will come multicolored. Isn't that neat? Uh, there's no difference in this hydrometer and this hydrometer, okay? They both measure the same way. They measure the same thing. Uh, someone thought it was a neat idea to make it blue, green, and orange for must, wine, beer, mash, things like that. It's, it kind of gives you a general area. Uh, that's what it's color coded for. So let me show you this. This is the hydrometer on this side, and this is the alcoholometer on this side. And I've only got one scale, the scale that we're normally accustomed to. Uh, in, in Europe, the, the European scale, I use bricks. They're more, more familiar with bricks than they are specific gravity. In the United States, we use specific gravity as opposed to bricks. As long as we know what we're talking about, believe it, they're all on the same device. All you got to do is know which one you're talking about. So let's use specific gravity since most of us are really, really familiar with specific gravity. Water, water, pure water, and I have a cylinder here. And I have a cylinder here. Both of these have water in them. And water, the specific gravity of water is 1. So we start off at 1.000. That's water. Now, you'll notice that a lot of times in terminology, when you're talking to another brewer, 
and they're talking about their gravity. And let me give you an example. Let's say that our specific gravity of our must, or our, yeah, our must for our wine is 1.050 right here. A lot of times, or the beer, or the mash, a lot of times you hear an experienced brewer to say, I'm at 50. Uh, they they kind of drop the first couple digits because it's just easy. If, if you know each other, it's easy to understand, hey, I'm at 50. Um, or I'm at a buck 50. Uh, whatever the case may be. As long as you both understand what you're talking about, it makes sense. If not, always be sure to use the full number. It, I'm at 1.050 on the gravity scale. That's my specific gravity. In this case, water, 1.000. Now that's on the hydrometer. On your alcoholometer, water is zero. Go figure. So this is the data point for water. And you'll notice the difference. Look, these two scales. So what that really means is that this scale starts, water starts here at the very top of this scale and it starts at the very bottom of this scale. So if you put these two together, that's just a continuous scale from bottom to top, or top to bottom. Kind of make sense? But zero or one being the center point or the data point where water is. Now I'm gonna prove that to you. We're gonna drop our hydrometer into water. Give it a spin like you normally would. You just kind of give it a spin. All the air bubbles come off the outside of it. And if you look at that, you'll notice that it floats at 1.000. Okay. Now we're going to drop the alcoholometer, proof and trail hydrometer. And that may be why some people get confused because it also has the word hydrometer in it. it. But it is a hydrometer because it's measuring in a liquid. So the proof and trail hydrometer, we drop that, give that a spin, but oh my golly, look at the where that one floats. That one floats at zero. And you'll see that there's a whole lot of that one sticking out. So if you get them mixed up, you'll know the difference. You'll notice it right away. This one will float way up in water. This one floats all the way down to the bottom in water where it should. All right, let me take these two out and lay them aside just a second. I'm gonna move these two glasses or two cylinders of H2O water. I'm gonna lay this to the side. I have another cylinder here of an undisclosed uh, liquid, and we're going to test that. have no idea what it is. I really do, but uh, it's for saying sake, it, I have no idea what it really is, but I want to find out what the alcohol content is. Well, let's try first the alcoholometer. Hint, hint. So we're going to drop that in. This is a proof and trail. Let's spin. You'll notice right away that it dropped pretty low, so that's going to tell us a little bit. And if you'll look at that, that's going to float at the 180. That's 180 proof, which is 90% alcohol. All right. That's a distilled spirit. That's, well, at least that's what the device indicates, that it's a distilled spirit. So it's pretty condensed when it comes to ethyl alcohol, which when you look at it now, you go water is here, lighter, 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 heavier, heavier, heavier. So alcohol, ethyl alcohol is a lot lighter than water. So it becomes thinner, thinner, and thinner. So we've gone way up on that scale. Notice from here, we've gone all the way up to here. So we're at 90% alcohol. All right. Let's remove that. Now here's what happens if you accidentally use the hydrometer, which is used again for exactly mash, beer, or wine, um, not spirits. But if you accidentally drop one in and you're trying to measure spirits with an alcohol, a hydrometer, here's what happens to it. It goes to the bottom, you lose it. It just drops to the bottom. Because remember, the scale starts here and goes this way. So I hope that really makes sense to you. It kind of it shows you the difference between the two scales. They are almost exactly the same thing, but they're just measuring in opposite directions. So one is valuable, the other one is useless to you, depending on what you're measuring. Now, let us continue on. Um, in order to find out what your alcohol by volume is, because we've talked about this before, and it's time for me to answer the phone. 
I'll be back with you in just a few moments. Okay, we're back. That's multi multitasking. It, it happens all the time. Uh, we'll answer the phone, so give us a call. We'll, you know, we'll answer. Uh, or we'll call you back. Leave, leave a note, we'll call you back. All right, let's get back to business here. <laughs> Let me erase this green line, since we know what these two are. And we're going to talk about alcohol by volume. We had this discussion once before. And now, there's a lot that goes into this. When you start talking about the science of brewing or winemaking or distilling, there's a lot of things that you have to keep straight in your mind. But because one affects the other, some of them are, are, are linear, they go together. There are some that are proportionately different, it, but it all depends. Let's not make it complicated, let's make it simple. Okay, ABV, alcohol by volume. Let's talk specifically about just wine or just beer. And we've got a five gallon bucket and we're making, let's, let's say for instance, we're gonna make a really, really good beer, okay? And in this particular case, the first time that we test, we've got all of our stuff inside of, uh, all of our grains inside our pot and we boil, we go through the boil for about 60 minutes, we've added our hops, we've done all of that. Everything's clean, sanitized, we've added the hops, we've allowed it to boil, we've cooled it, we've got it in the bucket, we brought it up to five gallons, and right prior to pitching our yeast, we make sure, first of all, that we're at 60 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. 60 degrees Fahrenheit because these are calibrated at 60 degrees. The same thing with the alcoholometer. Uh, if you're a little bit warmer than that, there'll be a little bit slight difference in the reading, but, and you can look online, yeah, there's, there's a formula you can use, and it's very, very minute, but it's just a couple of different, just a couple of points difference per 10 degrees. But make sure we're at 60 degrees. But when it comes to adding yeast, it's below 80 degrees for beer. Same thing primarily for wine and a lot of times for uh, mash as well. So we're below 80 degrees. We're getting as close to 70 as we possibly can before we pitch our yeast and we want to check the gravity. And in this particular case, we drop it in and we find out that we are at 1.050. Okay? We're at 1.050. Now, <laughs> we're going to allow... Let me, let me write this on here. Our initial gravity, OG, original gravity, was 1.050. So we're just going to write that down. Now we're going to pitch our yeast, we're going to allow that to ferment, and then after about 7 to 10 days, our fermentation is going to stop. Believe it or not, most of your fermentation happens in the first 72 to 96 hours, after which the remainder of that yeast is going to settle to the bottom of your fermenter, thereby clarifying and clearing out. Every once in a while, you'll get a burp. You'll get a bubble that'll come out of your airlock. But just remember, that's the residual CO2, one of the byproducts of that yeast eating. You're going to get a burp, so that's a residual CO2 doing what it naturally does, leaving. Uh, open up a can of Coke and set it on the counter. What naturally happens? Over a period of time, your Coke will become flat because CO2 naturally wants to leave. So the same thing happens after fermentation. The byproduct is ethyl alcohol and CO2. So you've got this fermented bunch, five gallons of uh, great wort sitting there, and it's got some CO2 in it. So after about 96 hours, really, 96 hours or so, uh, your primary fermentation has really ceased. The remainder of that time is that CO2 try to get out. So don't be confused. And you know, you walk by, I'm like, I've had people call me and say, George, it's been 14 days, and every couple of minutes I get a burp. I, say, I, I know it's it's going to keep doing that. It's the residual CO2 leaving, and they, they they get that confused with it's continuing to ferment. It's not. So we take our second reading at the end of fermentation, seven and ten days, and you'll figure that out. You'll know when it's actually finished. And after that seven to ten days, we find that our beer is at 1.010. Now, here's a question. Why does beer stop at 1.010 and wine goes all the way down to one or below one? Uh, why does a mash end at 0 0.002005 or go below one? 
but the beer stops at one. There are some beers that'll stop at 1.01020. It's all depends on the residual sweetness in the recipe. And there's a lot of other stuff in there. I call it the schmutz factor. You know, you got a lot of hops. There's a lot of thickness. The viscosity of gravity of your wort is going to be different based on the amount of fermentable sugars that are there. But since gravity can't discern between a sugar molecule and a solid molecule, you still got some residual molecules left in there, i.e. hops some grain, some of those other things that are still in there that's measured. So it will, it'll still measure a little bit higher and it'll fool you and make you think you've got fermentable sugars where you really may not have fermentable sugars in there. It may be that schmutz, you know, the excess solid material and particulates. Okay, so we've got that. Now here we're gonna figure out what is the alcohol by volume of that five gallons of beer? Original gravity minus final gravity times 131.25 will give you your ABV. We're going to do this the long way. This is the long method, but it works. And it's just the most scientific way to do this. And then there's a shortcut I'll show you. Okay. Grab a calculator. And we already know that 1.050 minus 1.010 is really going to equal 0 0.040. I, I already know that, but we'll plug it into the calculator. 1.050 minus 1.010 equals 0 0.040. So 0 0.040 times 131 times 131.25, and that's just a standard, that's a norm, equals this would equal oh, 0, 040 times 131.25 equals 5.25%. So that's a 5.25% alcohol by volume beer. So each one of the beers that you drink, 12 ounce beers will be 5.25% alcohol by volume. Make sense? Pretty simple, isn't it? It's pretty straightforward. Now, uh, it, hopefully you got all that down. Now, here's another interesting factoid about alcohol by volume and your hydrometer. If you rotate your hydrometer over a few ro rolls, because there's normally three scales on here. There's a brick scale, and then there's an alcohol by uh, uh, specific gravity, and then there's a potential alcohol by volume in percentage. And if you roll that over, you'll find that because it'll, it'll read on the side, it'll say alcohol percentage, alcohol, uh, per, approximate potential alcohol by volume. It'll be a percent. And in this particular case, here's what I do know. I do know that 1.0110, I know that that is equal to about 15%. I also know that at 1.079 or 80 or so is equal to somewhere around 10%. I also know that at 1.050 is about 6.2, somewhere, give or take, a little bit. But again, remember, this is a potential alcohol scale by percent. So we've kind of done the math for you ahead of time. What that allows us to do, though, it allows us to float our hydrometer and use that percent scale. And let's say, for instance, it floats at 10%, 1.080. Let's say, for instance, your alcoholometer or your hydrometer floats here. And then you pitch yeast, you allow it to ferment. When the fermentation's finished, you drop your, alcohol, your hydrometer in again. And this time, it floats Let's say here it floats at 20. Well, what is, I'm going to look on here and I'll tell you, 1.020 equals about 2.5%. So this is 2.5%. This is 10%. No point there. If I subtract 2.5% from 10%, I should get, should get 7.5%. 
percent ABV. So that's a shortcut. That's just a short method. So you could actually use your hydrometer to also figure out alcohol by volume without doing the longhand method that we've used. Well, that does it for measuring. Um, you know, one other topic that I wanted to touch on briefly was sanitation. Um, and we're not talking about operating room sanitizers. Uh, we're just talking about star sand. Uh, I've used this bottle. This is an eight ounce bottle and I've used it. You see how much I've got left. I've used it for two years. Uh, it's one ounce per five gallons, so it goes a long way, but it's a spray and use, spray, shake and use type. If you've got a clean utensil already, all you need to do is spray it, shake it, and then you can use it because it's a contact sanitizer. But remember, whatever you sanitize has got to be clean first. Now here's my caution. We have it in an eight ounce and in the four ounce bottles. It's one ounce per five gallons. Uh, just follow the directions. You know, two ounces per five gallons doesn't make it any better. But it, if you have a septic system at home, be very, very careful. Do not pour this down the drain because uh, it will kill all those bugs that you need in your septic system. And guess what? Yep, it's going to start to back up on you. You're going to call me. Uh, and I'm going to ask you if you pour some star sand down the sink. And then you got to go down to Walmart and get you some Rid X or whatever you got to do to replace all that bacteria that's in your septic system so it'll start to function again. So please do not pour any of this down the sink if you've got a septic system at home. But you can use it out in the grass. You, you know, just, just don't pour it in your septic system. It will kill all of those bacteria in there that you really need. So without further ado, that's about it for today, folks. Hope you've enjoyed the topic and we've demystified certain areas and maybe we've clarified some stuff. Please share us with your friends. And until next time, as always, happy distilling.